a major industry. We have a big jail. No, we haven't had any fires there, not too many. We have a lot of medical. We have a reformatory where there's a lot of kids. We have a major school up here. I mean, we've had deaths on the campus. Well, how could that be? These are smart people. We went into a laboratory one time when there was a people of Eastern descent, and there was a gas in there that was so strong that mice in the basement of the building were dead. And he got exposed to it. He didn't do well. So we have as a varied, we have forest. One of our firemen currently is um, one of the prime contact people with Jeffco on interface with the area between houses and forest. So we've got everything that you can have for fire. One thing we haven't done much of is the big ponds that are in Coors down there. I actually have a boat out in those ponds and do scuba diving, but wet water. So we've got everything, everything. Anything else, anybody? Karen? Tell them the story about the, the last big fire truck that you took to southwestern Colorado. Oh, we give fire trucks away now because on a trade-in, they don't get us a lot. Plus, if we trade a truck in, it goes into the general city budget and doesn't help the fire department. So what's the incentive? So we gave a fire truck to Sanford, Colorado. And I can always remember Sanford from Sanford and Sons. Sanford is Alamosa, south about 15 miles, and east about three miles towards the Rio Grande. One of the people in the fire authority down there said, was sending out letters all over Colorado. If you have something, God, we have nothing down here. Please help us. And so we sent them down what at that time was a reserve pumper. It was a 1982 Seagraves that we had had for over 30 years. And it was time to pedal it. So we drove it down to Sanford, Chief Bales, um, Ralph Jackwis. Matt Finley and myself. And here's a site, a fire chief's vehicle chasing a pumper going down the road. We pick up the fire authority person in Alamosa and we go down to Sanford. If anybody ever been to Sanford? First and second street of the state, <laughs> that's the town. There are two huge buildings in town. The school big building, K through 12, and beside it, the Mormon church. It's basically almost a totally Anglo community in San Luis Valley made up mostly of Mormons. So some guy came from the cattle plant in Alamosa and some came from pretty soon within 30 minutes of getting into town, we were surrounded by firemen. And these guys are really anxious because when we looked in their building, they had five pieces of equipment Two of them were scrap, and they were taking parts off them, and three of them were just barely functional. They had never seen an open fire truck, which ours had the open back from. So the first thing they had to do was get in the back and ride around town <laughs> with sirens going because there's no police. So they impressed everybody. And uh, wonderful people to work with. They were basically operating with very little, and so the city gave them that fire truck and that really made a difference to their community. It wasn't perfect for their community in that they deal with a lot of rural fires, which would be grass, weeds, ditch, barns, etc. But I think they made good use of it. So that, that was one of our trucks. We have a truck in uh, Adams, Nebraska. It was a 72, it was sold in the early 90s. We went to that town, a friend of mine went to that town, and he says, where's the fire truck? They says, oh, down there, the door appears to be locked, but you just shake it twice and the door will open it up, and go ahead and pull it out on the apron, you can take pictures of it. It used to be yours. And here's this truck in Adams, Nebraska, that they took the Golden Fire Department off the door and took the Golden Fire off and put Adams there, and that's all the changes they made to it. They put it right in service, and they've had it for 20 years now. So they, they're happy as hell. We have a truck at Fairmont, used to be a 79 
brush intermediate truck. All the Arvada or all the Fairmont's trucks are red. This truck's white, so that's what they call it, Whitey. They still use it. They send it on forest fires, and they made quite a bit of money off of it. So I can track everything we've ever had as it goes out. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. What's the most memories, memory of yours of the worst fire or the most crazy fire? <clears throat> There's a couple of them. The large fire we had at Coors in the bottle wash facility that went over 24 hours. And uh, a disgruntled employee who had been fired earlier in the day went in and if you, if you know what one quart bottles, how the boxes they come in, they're a fairly heavy cardboard box with the dividers. And in that building they had bottle stack 30 feet high, 100 feet wide by 200 feet, and he lit a fire in the middle of it. And the fire burned so hot that the glass vitrified when we finally got the fire out. In the middle was about an 80-ton block of glass and cardboard together. That was a long one. Ace High Uptown, 2 in the morning. Lot and lot and lot of smoke. I mean, you couldn't even see downtown Golden. The inside of the building was burning so violently that inside Foss's drugstore next door, where they had concreted up windows, the smoke was coming into Foss's screaming. It just sounded like a bunch of witches screaming in there. It was pressurizing in there. That was, that was a hot fire. And I was on the aerial fire truck, and the fire had come through the roof, and we were first set up. Downtown Golden has enormous water pressure and volume. And we were putting so much water in that hole in the roof, holding the fire down, that coming down the stairs by the bar, the water was running a foot deep. That was a, that was a neat one. What do you think caused that? <laughs> was, that's all apartments upstairs. And some guy had something on his stove and fell asleep, and it caught on fire. We had a house at uh, 16th Street between Washington and Jackson. It was the Heath House. It was a three-story house on the Jackson side. When it got put out, and about a week later they were hauling stuff out, they had had a deep freeze down in the basement, and all the meat and hamburger in the deep freeze was perfectly cooked. Just perfect. <laughs> that house had got that hot. Um, I remember Rappo Streets out here, one block up, when our fire, one of the firemen that I knew got killed. He felt, was knocked off the back of the truck, and he got, lost his life. Yeah, I was chief when Tom Young was paralyzed, and that was probably my worst experience in my life, dealing with the press, dealing with the Tom situation, trying, you know, what was going to become of that. Uh, today, Tom works part-time at the fire department. Well, he doesn't actually work, so they can't fire him. But his aide, who helps him in his health, works for the city. And so uh, that was a bad one. Uh, it was a July day, somewhere in July, I believe. And uh, I was going to a wedding, and I saw Tom at 19th Street at Highway uh, 6. He says, I'll cover it. He just got off work. And we had had a hand glider who was from out of state, and he was not familiar with the air, and he went south as opposed to most of them always coming, and he lit into a hill late in the day, it was after work, and there was a storm front coming. In addition, the helicopter had already taken off, and because they were trying to hurry and get him out of there before the storm front, the helicopter got too close, and he was pushing a hand glider out of the way, and the wind caught it and took him and flew him through the air, and he broke his neck. That's all, there's been a lot of, 1990. I can remember one of the worst ones for Jack, and it was shortly before we were married in 1949, and it was a fire at the chemistry building at the school of mine. Oh, I and bet. 
they broke a window and the flames came out, caught Jack right in the face. And thank the Lord, he went to a doctor that knew how to take care of it right away. And it was just kind of like a, a face peel. Didn't leave any scars. But that was on his worst. Yeah. <clears throat> My wife could sleep through the alarm. She just, you know, she got to where you, you just get used to them. And I was at a fire call where I got a large amount of smoke and stuff in. And uh, they called her and they said that I was being taken to the hospital. Did she want to come along? She says, no, just call me in the morning before they release him and I'll go down to the hospital. And she went back to sleep. I went to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, I think the things that have bothered me the most through the years on fire calls have been rescue calls dealing with small children or deaths. Another one that seems to stay with firemen is if you're at a call. Many times we have to wait in an accident for the corner. Usually you go to the fire and you're wham, bam, you're doing things, you're active, and you get the heck out of there. But if you have to stay there for a while, then it starts to soak in, I guess you might say. And that's of the firemen that I've talked to. Firemen have a terrible macabre sense of humor. Um, one of them that sticks in my mind forever is DRT. And somebody said to me, what's DRT? And the state patrolman asked our fireman what it was. And he says, well, that guy's dead right there. So, you know, one of the, one of the combats and one of the camaraderie of all these families has been that all the firemen have been through many of the same situations and they can talk to each other and they can joke about it and everything else. And that still happens today. If you take Foothills Ambulance and you talk to some of these ambulance tents, uh, boy, but if you realize the stories they're telling are therapy. It's just, just people run out of burning buildings, firemen run in. And that's just kind of way to think about it.